West Palm Beach. Nothing personal. Word of the day for Thursday, November 18th, 2021 is West Palm Beach. As in the suburb of Miami, north of Broward. Otherwise known as the location of the new spring training facility shared by the Houston Astros and Washington Nationals. Otherwise known as the place about 10 minutes south of Jupiter, the spring training home of the Marlins and Cardinals. Why would West Palm Beach ever be a word of the day? I love West Palm Beach. If you've never been in that county, it's worth it. Sometimes during the winter. Justin Verlander. Remember him? Kate Upton's husband. The World Series winning pitcher with the Houston Astros. Tommy John. Hasn't pitched since the World Series of 2019. Remember the trade deadline acquisition? Pitched in Detroit. The total workhorse offered a qualifying offer by the Astros, $18.4 million to a guy like Noah Syndergaard, who's coming off Tommy John. Noah Syndergaard gets $21 million from the Angels, and I think that it's the end of the world as we know it, even though I explained on a previous show why the Angels did what they did. Well, yesterday at 5 p.m. was the deadline for all 14 players to either accept or reject the qualifying offer that was granted to them. We know that Carlos Correa was going to reject it. Trevor Story was going to reject it. Corey Seager was going to reject it. Those are the shortstops who are going to be free agents. We were somewhat curious about what was going to happen with the closer for the Angels. Didn't accept it. Iglesias. What about Brandon Belt? Would he accept it? Giants first baseman, not worth $18.4 million anymore. He accepted. One guy out of 14 accepted it. Which means that 13 players are sure they're going to get either multi-year deals or one-year deals higher than 18.4. Because you don't reject your qualifying offer unless you are guaranteed that you are getting more money. That's why Noah Syndergaard did his Angels deal, got his physical done, passed his physical before the 5 p.m. deadline yesterday because if he had failed his physical, he would have taken the 18-4 from the Mets. Surprise, I'm back. Justin Verlander, I told you on November 8th, 2021, as part of a wait to see where I tell you something's going to happen. If it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But either way, I'll revisit it. On November 8th, I said Justin Verlander will accept the qualifying offer because $18.4 million for a 30, what is he, Coke, a 36, 37, 38 for an older free agent who's going to pitch 39 next season. But he hasn't pitched in two years. Power pitcher, power stuff. You take the 18 for I was a little nervous when Syndergaard didn't take his, and boy, did I lose that weight to see. Justin Verlander signed a two-year, $50 million deal with the Houston Astros, the team that gave him the qualifying offer, so they don't actually lose or get a draft pick. I guess they get their own draft pick. Remember, when someone signs your player who you offered a qualifying offer, you get that team's draft pick. So congratulations, Houston. You got Houston's draft pick. So Houston gets to sign a quote-unquote free agent pitcher without losing a draft pick. Very good. $50 million for Justin Verlander? Now you're going to say, David, he was making over 30 in his last contract. He's taking a pay cut. And I would say, yeah, he is taking a pay cut. Because coming off Tommy John, you don't know what you're going to get. And Justin Verlander did a showcase in front of 18 teams And listeners to Nothing Personal know exactly what the showcases are. They start with E and they end with H. Eyewash. You can't learn anything from a showcase. Oh, he's got good stuff. Look at that velocity. Mm. Get out the speed clock, the radar, the stopwatch. Oh, look at his time to first. Oh, look at that. He's in shape. He must have been eating vegan with Kate. Well, we don't have Zach Greinke, is what the Astros were saying to themselves. We need some veteran pitching to complement our young guys, Rakiti and Garcia. Garcia was in Rookie of the Year voting, but didn't win. You remember Rakiti, Framber Valdez. 
They still have Lance McCullers, who got hurt at the end of last year. What a perfect plan. We're going to round out our rotation. We're going to come right back to where we started, right back where we started from. That's going to do it. Here's the problem with Justin Verlander at a two-year, $50 million deal. Now, why am I saying two-year 50 when you've Googled it and it's a one-year, $25 million deal? Well, what you may have read is that it is a one-year, $25 million deal with a player option for a second year. You very well know. Say it. Come on. I wish I had a studio audience right now, Coca. I could just call on someone. What does a player option mean? A player option means that if Verlander does not pitch well and is not worth $25 million in year two, he will call up Houston at the end of year one and say, Hi, I'm Justin. Kate and I have decided to stay in West Palm Beach during the spring and come pitch in Houston during the season. Pay me my $25 million. And then when you're the GM of the Astros, you go to the owner and you start marking all your contracts to market and you say Verlander's worth about $6 million. We're paying him twenty five. million. Not a good start to our 2023 team. What's the other alternative? The other alternative is Verlander deals all season long. 32 starts, a 3.1 ERA, 202 innings, 200 strikeouts, 50 walks, win 16 games. Just an unbelievable ace-like year. He says to the Houston Astros, Dear Houston, thank you for the player option of $25 million. Although I'm going to be 40 years old, I don't use the needle, and I'm ready to go two more years. I'm not picking up that player option because I want $35 million a year over the next two years. Give me another 70 over two. Will you do that? No? All right, let me call 29 other teams. I'll be right back to you. Calls 29 teams and says, hey, you want me for $26 million for a year? Any interest? And then he calls up Houston and says, I decline the player option. Thanks so much. And I know I pitched great for you, but you don't get me. So a player option will never, never be to the benefit of a team ever. There is no scenario. Ever. If I'm looking at signing a player, I'm doing my homework. It doesn't mean I'm going to get the signings right. It doesn't mean I'm not going to get trumped by the owner. It just means that I'm going to learn a little bit about this player. Justin Verlander was very clear that he wanted something. When you're Justin Verlander's age, you've made the money he's made. You actually have an opportunity sometimes to choose things that other players don't get a chance to choose. But why would you make it public? Word came out, not through his brother Ben, who broke the story that he signed with the Astros, that he wanted to do spring training in Florida, not Arizona. I used to love when players would say that. Oh, I really want to be in Florida. It's closer to my home in the Dominican, or I've, it's closer to my family in North Carolina. What's the difference between Phoenix and North Carolina and Fort Lauderdale and North Carolina? Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's a couple hours on the plane. Yeah, you are right. Spring training goes from mid-February to the end of March. It's six weeks. Oh, I'm going to limit myself to half of the available teams because I want to be close to home. Players actually do that. That equals leverage for the teams. Because if you're a West Coast team who spring trains in Arizona, don't even think about Verlander because he already said, I'd rather spring train on the East Coast. So if you're on the East Coast, you say, ah, he's got to be with one of us. Let's make sure we don't overbid. But then you do a little more homework and you say, huh, do you know that Justin and Kate have a home in West Palm Beach from when he used to be with the Astros? And they bought a home and they love being there. Who wouldn't love being in West Palm Beach during the winter months? Who wouldn't love to be able to live at home during spring training? We had a lot of Marlins players who would buy homes in Jupiter where we would go spring training. You think we didn't know that? So the Astros know he wants to be in West Palm Beach and still... They overpay. I don't want the reputation that you believe that I will always call every contract an overpay. Because I don't. At all. What I do call out 
is when people on one side of a negotiation do not fully use the leverage they have to their advantage because they're scared or they're desperate. I think earlier this week we had desperation as a word of the day, and we should, because players love it when owners are desperate. Jim Crane, the owner of the Astros, you could see him when they lost to the Braves, how angry he was, how desperate he is to win his second World Series so that 2017 can just be a memory for the people of Houston and for him and the organization. They can get rid of that blot. Is that the word? Stain? Blot? His GM, Mike, says to him, we got a lot of young pitchers. Let's, let's bring in a veteran. We got to do it. And he knows us. He knows us. $25 million. Okay. There you have it. I don't know what else to say about that, Coca. I guess we'll wait to see. When he picks up his player option, we will have waited, and then we see. Of course, Verlander's going to pick up the player option at $25 million in 2023. You just wait. Right now, there are owners meetings going on in Chicago, Major League Baseball. Thursday is the main meeting. They do committee meetings on Wednesday. That's been the normal schedule, Wednesday, Thursdays. When some owners have different plans, they switch it to Tuesday, Wednesdays, but in general, it's Wednesday, Thursday. The first day of the owners' meetings, different committees like the Competition Committee, the Diversity Committee, the International Committee, you get presentations, where we are, where we're going, what we're trying to do. Then there's a Strategic Initiative Committee that talks about relocation, expansion, realignment. Of course, there is the Executive Council, which is sort of like the top of the board of the directors of the owners. They have a meeting. And then Wednesday night, there's a dinner where you get together at a restaurant and the commissioner gives a little speech. This is the first owners meeting since the World Series. So part of his speech always starts post-World Series. Let's start, the commissioner would say, by congratulating the Atlanta Braves for winning the World Series and all of the teams who participated in the playoffs, which were a great success. Let's go to the video. And then they show a video of highlights and there's great music. And then there's a star they get to narrate like Rob Lowe or someone else, James Earl Jones. They narrate sort of a commercial of how great it is. And everyone looks around the room and smiles, except they're not happy. It is the fakest moment in the year of an owner. When the World Series team who wins is congratulated by the commissioner and you have to give that owner an ovation. So you've got 30 presidents and you've got 30 owners and then the Atlanta Braves are singled out. Terry McGurk is there and John Scherholz and we have to go like this. It's an ovation. And I would always look around and the other owners and presidents, they're not happy for the Braves at all. They're not happy for Terry or for John. They pretend they are. They say they are. Oh, it's so great. I'm so happy for you. Your second one, first since 1995. Ugh. Oh, you're, you're steaming inside because you so badly want to be that person who won the World Series, who's designing rings and getting ready to repeat or at least defend your title. And you're worried about your own payroll, your own team. But for that moment in time, you're giving an ovation. That, those are the claps that take place during owners' meetings. You clap when they introduce a new owner, and then the commissioner gives the same joke, hey, that's the last ovation you're going to get, because in most cases it's true because it's so hard to win a World Series. And then you clap when there is a World Series win. Once in a while, there is an ovation for someone who's retiring who didn't get fired. So when an owner is selling, like when the Wilpons sold to Steve, it would be announced, hey, this is Fred's last meeting. Thank you, Fred, for all you did, and Jeff, for all you did for our industry. And you get an ovation on the way out. And then believe me, you are yesterday's news so fast that your head would spin. You think that you've been in an industry for 18 years, 25 years, 30 years, and the king is dead. Long live the king. I always heard that expression growing up. And I never understood what it meant until baseball. What it means is that while everybody 
genuflex in your general direction and you have this false inflated sense of self-worth and importance that's based on your role playing a kid's game and being in charge of something and doing a job that everybody wants to do. You're in every room that ha where it happens and then one minute the light just goes off. And when the light goes off, it never goes back on. But you can live in the glow of the ovation. <laughs> I got two ovations in my career. One in 2004 at the owner's meeting congratulating us on the 2003 World Series. And the other one was upon the franchise swap when the Expos were sold to baseball and the deal was announced. The ovation was, I can't believe that they were able to figure this out and get this deal done. Did not get an ovation when Jeter fired me from at my last owner's meeting because the owner's meeting to approve Jeter as owner was done by phone. And so I didn't even get goodbyes. It was just psh, the light went off and no one was home. So this owner's meeting is a very big one. Usually the first owner's meeting after the season is dull. You congratulate the World Series champion, you get a final revenue update, and then you get projections for next year's revenue. You get sort of an inkling of what your revenue sharing will be, an inkling of what your central revenue will be. Projections, really. There's a summary, a nice video, and that's about it. This year, totally different. This year, this is the last owner's meeting before the expiration of the collective bargaining agreement. Remember, during COVID, the owners were meeting every week, but that was by call. I'm talking about the official quarterly owners' meetings that under the bylaws of baseball, you have to have four owners' meetings per year. In-person owners' meetings during COVID, they would do them officially by phone, but I'm talking with the secretary with minutes. I don't mean a secretary as in a secretary. I'm talking about a corporate secretary where there's attendance. You have to have, you have to notice provision all of the agendas, uh, items on the agenda all the items in the agenda. But this year, with the final meeting before the collective bargaining agreement expires on December 1st, the real focus of the meeting was on what's happening with negotiations with the union. And so first, the executive council gets updated by the people on the labor committee, which would be Rob Manford and Dan Hallam. And then there's always two or three owners who are on that negotiating committee who are at the table with the players and with Scott Boris's players and Bruce Mayer and Tony Clark. Then the different committees get updated what's in the new collective bargaining agreement or what will be different that would impact that committee. So for example, the diversity committee, there may be a conversation about the new CELIG rule that we talked about in a previous show and whether or not that's going to be codified inside the agreement or what's going to happen with international play with the international committee that we are going to get approval in the collective bargaining agreement that there will be uh, each team will participate in an international game over the course of this five-year deal and the players have pre-agreed to that so you get updates that are specific to the area of your committee competition committee there'd be a conversation about any rule changes that are going to be put into the agreement any changes to the all-star game, forcing players to come, all of that. But in the main meeting, there is a discussion of the general economic parameters and an update of where the negotiations are. But Rob Manford and Bud Selig before him were always very, very clear that they didn't want to give too much information to too many owners about the negotiation because it always used to be a sieve inside that ownership room. Bud Selig would laugh and say that I say something in the meeting and the media has it before the meeting's even over. How do you guys do it? Do I have to take your phones from you? Do I have to check all of your phones to see who is literally taping me or writing a note to Ron Blum of the Associated Press and telling him exactly what's happening and we're still talking about it. It would always infuriate him. Ironically, he provided the most leaks of any of them. Bud did. But you don't give a lot of information in the main meeting and it's been pretty tight-lipped, I must say. Maybe the owners and the players got the memo that the public back and forth, the negative discourse, the threats, that we as a group of fans and sponsors 
not interested, don't care. Shut up and negotiate and let me know when it's done. Leave me alone. It's not going to matter whether you've curried my favor. That's not going to get a deal done faster. So stop trying. Stop wasting valuable time when it's the only commodity that we don't control and can't buy more of. Stop wasting time trying to pander to different constituencies. We're not voting for you. We don't need updates. We are consequentialists. Tell me when it's done. I don't need to see how the sausage is made. I want to eat the damn hot dog. Well, one of the other subjects that's being talked about in addition to the labor agreement is the Tampa Bay Rays and the Oakland A's, the two teams that are stadiumless, the two remaining teams who have to cut deals. Oakland is figuring out whether they're going to move to Vegas. Please go back and listen to that episode where we took the survey of whether or not people in Vegas would want the team in Vegas. That was a funny one, Coca. I enjoyed that episode. I think that was probably a few weeks ago. Coca does a summary of each episode. If you're on Apple Podcasts, I don't. I think that may exist on Spotify too. So you can actually search and see what the words of the day are and what movie we've reviewed, etc. I'm sure that in the update outline of that show, it talked about the Oakland A's survey. Tampa is a little more complicated because they've been trying to do this split city plan, wink, wink, where they're going to play half their season in Montreal in a new, brand new open air facility and play half their season in Tampa in a brand new open air facility. So remember, they're going to play in Tampa in April and May, and then in Montreal in June, July, and August, and then Tampa in September. Good luck. It's a good plan. Split season. Tampa keeps doubling down. They leaked and let it be known that at this owner's meeting, Stuart Sternberg, the owner of the Rays, is going to ask the executive council for permission to further explore, if not finalize, the split city plan. And everyone's writing about this like, wow, it's happening. I can't believe it. Well, I've got a surprise for you in Montreal and in Tampa. Worse hockey. Asking the executive council for permission to, to, to explore further the split city plan is like asking the executive council the way we did to explore relocation and have the commissioner grant you that right to explore relocation. It doesn't mean squat. There's going to be articles everywhere coming out of these meetings progress made, seriousness demonstrated. Major League Baseball sends a message to Tampa and to Montreal. We're on our way. Well, there's going to be a lot of math that has to be done before that deal happens. And here's how the math goes. How much money would a new owner in Montreal be willing to pay to get an expansion team in Montreal? How much money would a new owner in Nashville or Charlotte or Portland, or San Antonio, or Mexico City, or London, be willing to pay for an expansion team? How much money is an owner willing to pay John Fisher in Oakland or Stuart Sternberg in Tampa to relocate to Montreal or to New York, New Jersey, third team, or to somewhere else? We're going to get a billion dollars in expansion fees. We can't take Montreal out of the running for an expansion city because then the other cities and owners in those other cities may not want to pay the billion dollars that we want for each expansion team. Because mark my words, we are expanding to 32 teams in the next half decade. So if we're going to willy-nilly take two cities out of the loop, why do I say two? Because when you move a team to another city, take a look at what's happening in Seattle with the Supersonics. You spend the next 10 years trying to get a team back. Montreal let the Expos move, didn't get a stadium done, couldn't get a TV deal done. I was just the last man standing on the Titanic. It just couldn't get done. And now Montreal is climbing all over itself to get a team back. Way cheaper to keep a team than to get a team. It's the same thing with your clients. Whatever business you're in, it's way cheaper to keep your client than to go out and get a new client. So don't forget to not ignore your current clients. People have a tendency, oh, he's fine, he's a client, I'm gonna just, I'm all about new business, business development. It is way cheaper and more efficient to keep your existing clients than to buy or go get a new one. 
Same thing for cities. Way cheaper to keep your team and to do a public-private partnership than it is to wait and then get a new team to come to you. It happens time and time again. So MLB is doing the math of what the opportunity cost would be of this split city idea, how realistic it is to get two new open ballpark, open air ballparks built, what the TV deal would look like, because you may have been reading about the issue with RSNs, regional sports networks. That's a whole different segment, but suffice it to say that all the money that's been flowing to teams for local broadcast revenue, which is the most important revenue stream that a team has, way more than ticketing, way more than revenue sharing, way more than anything, it's your local broadcast deal. How much money will they get in Montreal for the Montreal Bay Rays? Or the Tampa Real, the Tamreal Rexpos? Oh, I think what their name will be is the Mantra Bay Guardians. I think that's what I think that's what I read is going to be their name when they split. So you got to see the TV deal, you got to see the stadium deal. But guess what else you need that no one's talking about except me for the last 2 years that this idea was floated as pure leverage to get a deal done in Tampa or somewhere else. The players have to agree to this. When we built a new ballpark in Florida, the players didn't have to agree that we were doing it in Miami versus Fort Lauderdale versus Palm Beach versus Orlando even. When you are asking players to have two homes during the season, when you're asking players to move their families in the middle of a school year, when you're asking players to have two rents because we don't pay the players rent where they live. You're asking a team to pay for its employees or unless you're going to have two sets of employees, maybe you'll have a clubhouse manager in Tampa and a clubhouse manager in Montreal. Very unlikely. Maybe you'll have a sales staff in Montreal and a different sales staff in Tampa. More likely, but there will be a group of employees that will need to go from Tampa to Montreal when the team would move as part of the split city. That doesn't need union approval. But for the players to do it, that absolutely needs to be approved and in the collective bargaining agreement that it is contemplated and agreed to that the Tampa Bay Rays will explore. And then if it works out, you have, by signing this document, approved a two-city solution. Here is the likelihood that the new collective bargain agreement will include a provision where the players have agreed that they will allow half a season in Tampa and half a season in Montreal. Zero. It's not going to happen. The whole split city idea is not going to happen, but please continue to get excited by the articles and all the things you are going to read that the owners meeting had a big discussion and the executive council it will be announced by rob after the meeting because it will be asked he meets the media he'll be asked what's with tampa how are things he'll say well stuart sternberg made a very fine presentation it was very convincing in front of the executive council and we agreed with him that this is the best solution for the tampa bay rays going forward just wait it's going to happen when we come back, we're going to review a movie that I loved. It's an Oscar contender. It's in French. You're going to deal with it. And then we're going to tell you what John Henry's been up to. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. My name's David Sampson. Today is Thursday, November 18th, 2021. Thank you so much for rating, reviewing. Please put your ratings on Apple Podcasts. We're going to have a mailbag episode. I think we may drop a mailbag episode on Thanksgiving Day. Why not, right? Coca, does that work for you? And you tell your friends about nothing personal. The show continues to grow. Please keep telling people to download it and give us a try. We have found the retention rate for people who listen once. The, what was it like? 97% of people who listen to nothing personal once listen a second time. Was it something like that? That may have just been in a Xanax induced dream, but for whatever reason, I think I read that somewhere. So I still watch a movie every day, no matter what I do the previous night, day, no matter how many shows we tape or do, or how many appearances, no matter how many miles I run. I got a 
one of the listeners to Nothing Personal, thank you, sent me an article with the top 30 Oscar hopefuls because it's Oscar season now. So while I'm watching a bunch of different movies, I also want to make sure I'm watching Oscar contenders. And one of them was a movie named Titan. And as you know, I didn't read about it, didn't know anything about it. And I put it on. And lo and behold, it's in French. No problem. I'm in. I don't mind movies with subtitles because when they're good enough, you don't even remember that there are subtitles. And I speak enough French that I can sort of understand what they're saying, but I've got the subtitles in English to make sure that I'm right. This is a movie about a little girl who gets into a car accident, gets a titanium plate put in her head, and becomes a little bit clay-clay. This is a movie that is part Point of No Return, part Aliens, part It's a Wonderful Life with a little tinge, just a tiny bit of an unbelievable family dynamic that will make you tear with your jaw on the ground. It is visually a beautiful, interesting, rough movie. Every shot is purposeful in terms of its lighting, the accompanying music. It is a zero phone check movie. It's called Titan. I believe you have to spend money to rent it and it will be worth every penny. It's gonna take about 800 million pennies to do what John Henry's trying to do. John Henry is the owner of the Red Sox, but that's really not even his day job. John Henry, the guy who was a fund manager, he was a contrarian options, did a lot of feng shui stuff in the markets, sort of an analytic market guy, program trading, made money, bought the Marlins, got into baseball, said we'll get a new stadium, couldn't get a new stadium, said get me out of Florida, sold the Marlins to Jeffrey Lurie, bought the Red Sox. He was a huge small market proponent when he owned the Marlins. Then he moved to the Red Sox and stopped caring about small markets because he was in a large revenue team with a large market. Became one of the great large market hawks in the game. We went toe to toe with him over between 2002 and 2017, over a 15 year period. I was toe to toe with John Henry at least once a year on economic issues in the game. He started something called Fenway Sports Group. Fenway Sports Group is the parent company that owns the Boston Red Sox. They own Liverpool. Yes, that Liverpool. They own Roush Racing. And their goal is to take over the sports world. And to take over the sports world, remember that LeBron is a partner now? One of the things you need to do if you want to take over the sports world is you can't just own a baseball team and a premier soccer league team. You got to get a basketball team, you got to get a football team, and you got to get a hockey team. And believe me, that's what Fenway Sports Group is doing. They're starting in hockey. They want to buy signature franchises only to go with Liverpool, to go with the Red Sox. They're not buying the Minnesota Timberwolves. They would want to buy the Celtics or the Knicks or the Lakers. They have an agreement in place, word came out yesterday, to purchase the Pittsburgh Penguins. What? The Pittsburgh Penguins? Why wouldn't it be the Montreal Canadiens or the Boston Bruins or the New York Rangers? If you're going to say that all you want is quality, I guess you could say that they won a bunch of cups under Mario Lemieux. They won a couple cups with Sidney Crosby. When you think greatest franchises in the NHL, do you think Pittsburgh? I love the Penguins, but I don't picture that. Now, why would you buy the Penguins? Because 
they're having tremendous financial difficulty. Mario Lemieux is one of the limited partners of the Penguins, along with a guy named Ron Burkle. They run the team. COVID crushed them. Hockey in general is hanging on by a thread. EPL and MLS would be considered one of the four major sports before hockey these days. Hockey does have a new TV deal. They're back on Turner and on ESPN+. Plus. There's a little bit of TV revenue coming in for the first time. Gate revenue's down. COVID crushed them by like over $3 billion in revenue. What a great opportunity when you've got cash. The lesson to be learned with Fenway Sports Group is pretty simple. And it's a lesson that applies to all industries and all businesses. And it's why you say to yourself over dinner sometimes, how come I struggle every day, but rich people keep getting richer? How come during COVID everyone's on their ass, but certain companies and certain CEOs and certain individuals were crushing it, increasing their net worth tenfold by billions and billions of dollars. And the reason is a very simple economic principle that it takes money to make money. And it sounds so unfair, but it's the corollary to the expression, hey, we're looking for someone with experience. Well, how do I get experience? Well, that's not my problem, but we're only hiring experience. But if you don't give me this job, then no one will give me a job. So let me just get experience with you and then I'll go to the next guy and I'll have experience. Won't you be my neighbor? So John Henry has billions of dollars, both in liquidity and in capacity. And he wants to take over the world. Meh. Good luck, John. That deal is going to happen. Fenway Sports Group is going to get the Penguins. And mark my words, I don't want to make it a wait to see, but it really could be a wait to see, Coca. Fenway Sports Group will buy an NBA team, and they will buy an NFL team. I mean, if John Henry gets to it before, he's not old. I think he's only in his 70s. He's got 20 years of active corporatoring to do. He's setting up Fenway Sports Group to continue on after he's done, or he's setting it up for one of the great multi, multi, multi-billion dollar acquisitions of all time. I give him credit. Nothing personal pick of the day. We are 155 and 136 because I told you we swept the Cy Youngs. Burns of the Brewers pitched fewer innings than Zach Wheeler, but was just a better pitcher. He won Cy Young. Robbie Ray, the $8 million free agent, the greatest signing ever by Ross Atkins and Mark Shapiro up there in Toronto. He won the Cy Young as well. But we lost one pick from yesterday. The Bucks only won by seven, not seven and a half. God, do I hate when that happens. I didn't see the end of the game because I was actually giving a speech at, a, uh, at my old law school. I was teaching a class. So I did not see it. Was there like a last second bucket to make it 109, 102? Was it 109, 100? Or was it 105, 102? And then became 109 with late free throws? I don't know how it ended. I guarantee you Coca doesn't know how it ended, but I guarantee it doesn't matter because an L is an L. Now, programming note. Tomorrow is a Samson sit down, November 19th, 2021. There will be a Samson sit down with Dan Shaughnessy. If you don't know Dan Shaughnessy, he is a prolific writer, one of the great beat reporters in Boston of all time. He has wrote some, he has written some, get rid of that, 14, 28, 69. He has written some incredible books about inside the world of sports, wrote a book about Babe Ruth, written about the Red Sox. He has a new book about Larry Bird and the 1986 Celtics. It was a fascinating sit down and you will have it tomorrow. So therefore, I got to give you picks for the weekend. So pay attention. Here we go. Because you are about to get six picks to last you till Sunday. You may have to put me on half speed so you can write down. But I'm going to talk about it in two times speed because we have one more topic to get to before the show ends. It's MVP tonight. AL MVP, that's a very difficult one, right? Shohei Otani, Vladimir Guerrero. It's Otani. In any other year, it would be Guerrero. Shohei Otani will win the American League MVP. National League is a much more difficult question. Juan Soto, Fernando Tatis, forget it. Juan Soto, maybe. Bryce Harper, maybe. It comes down to them. 
I'm going Bryce Harper over Juan Soto because Bryce Harper came back and had a second half of the season that was simply spectacular. Kept the Phillies in the race. But remember, all six players who are the finalists for MVP, not one of them played in October. Not one. Otani over Guerrero, Harper over Tatis. We have a Thursday night football game. The Patriots, everyone's saying, my God, I think the Patriots are going to play the Buccaneers in the Super Bowl. It's going to be unreal. They're playing so well. Matt Jones against... I was going to say Tony Romo against Tom Brady. For whatever reason, New England is giving a full touchdown to the Falcons tonight. Everyone's all of a sudden on the New England bandwagon. We're taking the Falcons plus seven. Friday, we've got the Lakers playing the Celtics. Best rivalry in all of basketball, always. I don't care what the line is. LeBron James will play. The Celtics are not the team that they want to be right now. I think they're only 7-8 and eight at the moment. The Lakers are clearly not a good team. The Westbrook-Anthony situation is not going to work out. That said, the Lakers will not lose to the Celtics. And I think they're going to be getting points. Take the Lakers on Friday. Then we get into football weekend. My Badgers are only 9.5 over the Cornhuskers. 9.5 over Nebraska? We are all over the Badgers. And then we've got the best football game of the weekend, which I will be watching. Chiefs-Cowboys. Mahomes throws five touchdowns. He's back. Everything's great. Two and a half over the Cowboys. That's all they're giving because the Cowboys are the best team in the NFC, I guess, because Jerry Jones is finally going to get back to the NFC Championship for the first time in decades. Ah, it's a sucker bet. I'm taking the Chiefs and giving the two and a half. Okay, I want to end this week, this show with a few minutes about a subject that is controversial and that I've got an opinion on and that it bothers me greatly. You may never have heard of Peng Shui, because I hadn't. Peng Shui is a tennis player on the women's professional tour. She's Chinese. She's a doubles player who has won Grand Slams, been a number one ranked doubles player, I don't follow doubles as much as I should, I grant you. I only heard of her because news came out that no one's heard from her in two weeks. People disappear, right? They go on camping trips. They unplug during the off-season, go to Europe and travel around, go to a cabin in the woods and go hunting. Wouldn't think anything of it, except for the fact that Peng Shui disappeared right after she posted on social media that she had been sexually assaulted by a member of the Chinese government. She had the guts to actually go public with her story. She had the guts to call out an official for being inappropriate. You don't see that in China. And the reason you don't see it is everyone is scared. What did China do? They deleted her post. And then they deleted her. She has not been heard from at all. People in the WTA, fellow tennis players, are concerned. They're calling out China, saying, we want to know that she's okay. What did you do with her? The Chinese official is no longer in the government. He's in his 70s now. Hasn't been heard from, will not be heard from. He's sort of retired. They've decided that their best course of action, China did, was to get a statement out from Peng Shui. So they did it in the form of an email to the head of the WTA, a guy named Steve Simon. And Steve Simon got an email from Peng Shui and said, this is not you, Peng Shui. This is clearly propaganda written by the Chinese government. And then he released his own statement. And I give him so much credit. I have a hard time believing that Peng Shui actually wrote the email we received 
or believes what is being attributed to her. She displayed incredible courage in describing an allegation of sexual assault against a former top official. The WTA and the rest of the world need independent and verifiable proof that she is safe. I have repeatedly tried to reach her via numerous forms of communications to no avail. Now, I guess it's possible during the course of this show that the feed's going to go blank. We're going to get unplugged, Coca. I guess maybe I have to look both ways when crossing the street, and I don't mean because of the bike lanes. Because I'm coming out and saying it. How dare you? How dare you be in a world where you think that because of the way your government is that you are going to stop a woman from saying anything regarding her body and an assault that took place because you think that it will be a black eye upon your community and your culture and your people and you censor and God knows what you've done with her and then you pretend to be her and thinking that'll take care of it. Who's making the decisions in China? Who actually believes that the way you run your country is the right way? Do you go to bed at night saying, I will protect what is mine to the detriment of every man, woman, and child in China, and they will all do exactly what I want them to do. And the minute they step out of line, they will be disappeared. Is that sustainable? You may think it is. You may think you have the upper hand. This Peng Shui situation is not going away anytime soon. It's a different world right now, and we're catching up to you. We're going to take responsibility and make you take responsibility. Do I believe that China can change? I believe it's going to take a lot of old men to die first. But I do believe it. I know you're not listening to this because you're not allowed to listen to nothing personal in China, even before today and especially after today. But I guarantee you that if someone is hearing this who has any way to connect with Peng Shui, let her know that we are with her. We will not forget her. And everyone is going to keep trying to get you safe and out of China. That's our show. China. To them, it's just business. It's nothing personal.